Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Courtney. I'm the lead athletic trainer at Stanford and a planner for this webinar. Today, I have with me Dr. Aaron Grebe and Timothy Liu. Dr. Grebe is one of our primary care sports medicine physicians, and Timothy Liu is a physical therapist and one of the supervisors of the rehab services at Stanford Children's Health. Together, they will be presenting on concussion care and the role of vestibular therapy. Hi, thanks for joining us today. As a sports medicine physician, I have the opportunity of caring for athletes, uh, sometimes from the moment they have a head injury, uh, if I happen to be on the sidelines, until they have completely recovered from their, that injury, whether it's within a few weeks or a few months. So I'm glad you're able to join us today for this very important topic. We're going to be discussing concussion, post-concussion syndrome, and then we're going to talk about the role of physical therapy in the treatment of concussion. I have no conflicts of interest or financial disclosures to report. So if we're looking at the numbers, uh, the CDC in 2009 uh, released the numbers that, two, that children made up 2 million outpatient visits and 3 million emergency room visits for head injury. A lot of these were mild and didn't need to be treated in the emergency room, um, but the previous numbers had been much lower, and that's because they had only included those who had a loss of consciousness included with their head injury. And so at that point, we started to see a jump in the numbers. Concussion makes up 9% of all high school sports injuries with the highest incidence in football, soccer, hockey, and rugby. The rate is higher among girls, and it's also higher uh, in competition situations rather than practice. So what is a concussion? It's a traumatic brain injury caused by a blow to the head. The head and the brain move rapidly, and you actually get chemical changes in the brain. Some people think it's just a, a bruise to the brain, but it's actually not. There's a whole complex pathophysiologic process that affects the brain. It's a temporary trauma-induced brain dysfunction, and it's actual functional injury to the brain, not just structural, and it does not require loss of consciousness. Post-concussion syndrome, these, this is where your symptoms last longer than what you would expect, typically about four weeks. This affects 10 to 30% of concussion patients, and the management of this requires a multidisciplinary approach. You want to identify the primary and secondary processes confounding recovery and develop a corresponding individualized treatment plan. Traditionally, management for this has just been an extension of management for an acute injury, as we really didn't have a lot of evidence uh, on the management of post-concussion syndrome. The symptoms uh, for post-concussion syndrome, you want to think about if there are persistent symptoms, you want to you want to consider associated injuries that may be causing those symptoms and that may benefit from rehabilitation or other treatments. These injuries would include cervical strain, vestibular injury, ocular motor disorders, any type of sleep cycle disturbances, uh, developing depression, anxiety, problems with attention. These persistent symptoms may be attributed to con to concussive injury itself, but you may actually have a potentially treatable problem that could be missed if we're just attributing all the symptoms to concussion. When I think about concussion symptoms, I think about them in four categories. We have our physical symptoms, which I think most people think about, such as headache, nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light or sound. Then we have our cognitive symptoms. Again, people typically think of these. You feel like you're in a fog, you feel a little slowed down, you have difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering. And then there's uh, the sleep symptoms, the drowsiness, you're sleeping more than usual, sleeping yes, less than usual. The group of symptoms that I find that some people often um, don't realize can exist are the emotional symptoms. Irritability, people are more emotional than usual, crying and not understanding why. <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of diagnosis, concussion is a clinical diagnosis. The presentation can be variable from one person to the next. 
and within one person from one concussion to the next. So it's important that you take a systematic approach to evaluation and you consider the symptoms in all of those four areas. In the office, we'll do an evaluation where we look at symptom score. And so this is the sheet that people will receive and they, uh, they circle their, the symptom score for each symptom. So for example, headache, if they're not having any headaches, they give a zero, but if they're having severe headaches, then they give a six. And we keep track of these over time. The greater the score and duration predicts longer recovery. So that's important to consider. If someone comes in and their score is a two versus uh, 60, then you know I wanna start thinking about, okay, I wanna make sure that I am giving that person the correct uh, treatment for potentially prolonged symptoms. You want to ask about the mechanism of injury, loss of consciousness, any prior concussion history, because this actually increases the risk of re-injury. You want to ask about baseline school performance and in any other medical history that, that could be pertinent, such as any uh, headache or migraine issues, learning disorders, ADHD, or mood disorders. For your exam, you want to look at affect and appearance, you want to do a basic neuro exam, and then we have these screening tools. So in my clinic, we'll do VOMS, which is vestibular ocular motor screening, and BESS, which is balance error scoring, scoring system. Some places also use impact testing, which is computerized neurocognitive testing. So in terms of VOMS, the rationale behind this is that dizziness is actually reported in 50% of athletes who have a concussion. And this is associated, if they, if they have dizziness, this is associated with a seven-fold increased risk of protracted recovery. You want to identify these patients with a vestibular cause for dizziness. And you want to get, you want to start vestibular rehab earlier. And Tim will talk about vestibular rehab in his portion of the talk today. In terms of treatment and recovery, this is actually one area where younger athletes don't do better than our older athletes. They have a longer recovery time. 80 to 90% of older adolescents return to baseline within two weeks, whereas younger athletes, it's typically more on the order of four weeks. As I mentioned, girls um, will have more concussions. They also have more symptoms, not necessarily prolonged recovery, but they do have more symptoms. Premature cognitive exertion has been shown to prolong symptoms. So what's new in terms of the treatment of concussion? Typically, um, prior to having a lot of research done on treatment for concussion, we would take athletes and stick them in a dark room and keep them there for two weeks and hope that their symptoms would resolve. And what we found is that you're taking very social people, very athletic people, and isolating them. You're isolating them from their teams, you're isolating them from their friends, you're cutting them off from all social interaction. And as a result, we're, we would start to get athletes with mental health issues. They were becoming depressed and anxious. And so it's important to really take an active individualized approach to the treatment. And we want to get them involved in early physical activity, social integration, and vestibular therapy. So in terms of the cognitive treatment, brain rest, this is unique to the developing brain. You want to involve school early, possible modified attendance, limited and untimed testing. So when athletes come in and they're diagnosed with a concussion, we actually give them a letter for accommodations for school. And I tell them, when you think you can tolerate about 30 minutes of, act of cognitive activity, then that's time to start considering going to school for a shortened day. They can always go to the nurse's office, they can always leave early, but I wanna get them back into school uh, as soon as they're able to tolerate it. You want to limit computer use, reading and texting if these are symptoms, if these are exacerbating their symptoms. If they're not, then it's okay for them to use these. So I tell people, test it out. If you're on the computer for a few minutes and you're noticing that you're having an increase in symptoms, 
then you're not ready for it. But if you're fine, then it's okay. And, and I really counseled athletes to, they're responsible uh, for being honest with themselves and with me and their family. I can't put a cast on their brain and make sure they don't use it um, like I can for fractures. So they really need to be honest with themselves and say if they're having symptoms or not. For your uh, adolescent athletes, you also want to restrict driving because uh, their reaction time could be in affected. In terms of physical, uh, in terms of the physical treatment, you, we want to have relative rest and you want to do that for a few days. But as soon as possible, you want to initiate some very low impact activity. So actually non-impact, you, but you want to have just this low level cardiovascular activity. I tell athletes, it's great to get outside and go for a walk, walk around the block. You're getting fresh air. You're getting a little bit of activity. This is really low risk, should not exacerbate symptoms, and it actually may help speed their recovery. I don't want them sitting in their room for days on end. You want to avoid that prolonged inactivity because it actually increases the risk of post-concussive symptom, symptom, syndrome. In terms of the social aspect, prolonged isolation, prolonged symptoms. You want to get these individuals involved in their social networks and their normal routine. You want to encourage that reintegration as early as possible. If they're not able to return to school yet, I suggest maybe they have a friend stop by for a, for a few minutes to uh, spend some time with the athlete so they're not completely isolated. So it's really important that we get them back to their normal routines and their friends. Prolonged symptoms. What about the 10 to 30% that don't resolve in four weeks? You want to think about vestibular ocular therapy, exercise therapy, neuropsychological evaluation, and medications. One medication that I uh, suggest in clinic is MyRelief. So this is has been shown to help um, uh, people who are suffering from migraines. It also helps those um, with concussion with prolonged headache as part of their concussion symptoms. Okay, uh, in terms of the management, so headache medication. So for post-traumatic headaches, there's limited evidence supporting the use of pharmacologic interventions, and you may actually have medication overuse headaches. You wanna to talk to them about lifestyle modifications, things that we should all be doing, but are particularly important from those recovering from a concussion. Things like sleep hygiene, hydration, exercise, avoidance of triggers, stress management, and then you can talk to them about preventative or abortive type medications. So you have, uh, here I have listed ibuprofen, naproxen, tryptans, and, am and amitriptyline. So NSAIDs such as ibuprofen and naproxen are used initially with variable results. And if there is an insufficient response to NSAIDs and the headaches have a migranous feature, have migranous features, um, oops, Um, then you, you can consider things uh, such as serotonin agonists or tryptans, and they're often used and tolerated well in children. The American Academy of Neurology um, recommends consideration of preventive medications when headaches are occurring more frequently than twice per week. Um, there was a retrospective study of adolescents at a regional concussion clinic, and 82% of patients were noted to have a benefit from the use of amitriptyline. There's also emerging data on the use of melatonin for the treatment of persistent post-traumatic headache, as well as uh, migraine prevention. And vitamin B2 or riboflavin has been shown to be an effective prophylactic treatment for uh, migraine headaches, which has sometimes been extrapolated uh, for post-traumatic headaches. High dose magnesium, coenzyme Q10, um, they do have some evidence in the prophylaxis of migraine headaches, but there hasn't been any uh, properly designed and powered clinical trials in the, in the pediatric concussion population. And opiates should never be used for the treatment of pediatric headaches. In terms of uh, neuropsychological evaluation, uh, so neuropsychological recovery following a concussion is quite positive. 
Some of the risk factors for more enduring cognitive and behavioral changes following the concussion or mild traumatic brain injury are, are actually those that were factors prior to the concussion. Um, low SES, a history of learning disorders, ADHD, and, uh, and or mood disorders. Cognitive defects, especially in the domains of attention, concentration, and distractibility are quite common in post-concussion syndrome. And these symptoms do often resemble uh, those in ADHD. And there's been some limited evidence showing the benefits of stimulants in uh, the treatment of post-concussion syndrome. Uh, immediate release methylphenidate has some positive impact uh, in the domains of attention, fatigue, and depression. Um, although not specifically a stimulant, amantadine is thought to potentiate dopamine, giving it a stimulant-like effect. There is a small, one small cohort study of adolescents with post-concussion syndrome and found that the use of amantadine actually improved symptoms and cognitive performance um, when compared with uh, controls. It's also been proposed that persistent symptoms after a concussion are strongly linked to non-neurologic variables, such as uh, uh, notably issues such as anxiety, trauma, and other psychosocial interventions should uh, play a role in the treatment of uh, post-concussion syndrome. CBT has been shown to help reduce uh, pain frequency and severity, reduce associated stress, anxiety, and, and depression, improve sleep, and improve function across domains, including school and physical activity. Um, so recent research actually supports the effectiveness of CBT for a pediatric headache. Um, while the research on CBT for post-concussion syndrome is limited, particularly for children, existing research is promising. Um, antidepressants, uh, specifically SSRIs, have been shown um, to be a good primary treatment for concussion-related mood symptoms. And then in addition to melatonin, as, we, as I previously mentioned, trazodone is often used uh, in the brain injury population to treat sleep disorders in the acute phase after uh, traumatic brain injury. All right, so management, vestibular ocular therapy. Um, vestibular ocular uh, dysfunction is common. 29% of those with acute sports-related concussion and 63%, we, we see it in 63% of those with post-concussion syndrome. If vestibular ocular dysfunction is seen in the acute phase, it took twice as long to achieve clinical recovery and people were four times as likely to develop post-concussion syndrome. And so that's why it's so important. It's such an important new emerging treatment and topic to discuss today. Vestibular uh, rehab therapy can start in the acute phases of concussion, and it can actually possibly reduce overall symptom duration. It's more effective than continued cognitive and physical rest in reducing persistent symptoms of dizziness, unsteadiness, and imbalance in adolescents with persistent post-concussion syndrome. Just briefly, future directions. Um, education, we're gonna continue ongoing efforts in terms of prevention in concussion, uh, equipment modifications are being studied, behavior modifications are being addressed, and rule changes. Diagnosis, we're continuing to validate current assessment tools. We are delineating the role of neuropsychological testing, improving identif identification of those at risk for prolonged symptoms, and we're also looking at neuroimaging techniques and biomarkers for diagnosis. Again, for treatment, uh, continuing to look at early exercise as treatment and vestibular rehabilitation. Thank you uh, for joining us. And I'd like to turn it over now to Tim to talk about the role of uh, physical therapy in the treatment of concussion. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Tim Liu. I'm a physical therapist at Stanford Children's. Uh, I work in our sports and orthopedics uh, department and I also see uh, patients with concussion and post-concussion syndrome uh, in our clinics. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the role of physical therapy in concussion management uh, and specifically what that looks like in terms of uh, an assessment role, intervention role, uh, and how that might change uh, the way that you practice or the way that you refer patients. 
I have no financial disclosures. Uh, the objectives of our talk today uh, is really to identify a couple things uh, and be able to do that coming away from this. So uh, I'd like uh, individuals uh, who are participating to be able to identify maybe at least two different symptom presentations of patients suffering from concussion uh, that would benefit from a physical therapy referral, um, identify two domains of physical therapy assessments in relation to concussion, and identify two different objective measures to consider when returning to sport uh, or clearing individuals for return to sport after concussion. Uh, and some of the epidemiology, I'm just going to go over briefly because I know Dr. Grieb already went over quite a bit of this, but uh, symptoms in relation to kind of post-concussion syndrome or concussion, uh, not a surprise here, but headaches, dizziness uh, are big ones and prevalent in a lot of those cases, cognitive issues, fatigue issues. Um, but really where we start to see some role and relevance in physical therapy is in some of this ocular function or vestibular function where we're seeing anywhere in the 40s to 50s, sometimes 60% in some of these young athletes. Uh, one paper from Zoo and Brodsky uh, was looking at about 42 younger individuals with concussion, uh, and they did a panel or, or a battery of balance and vestibular testing and found about 90% of those individuals tested with some sort of abnormal finding. Um, so we're seeing some of these, some of these elements uh, in testing um, kind of come through uh, that may benefit from some sort of physical therapy uh, involvement to address some of these impairments or abnormalities. So really who would kind of benefit from physical therapy? Um, this, is, this is kind of broad and overarching, uh, and we're gonna dig into each of these categories a little bit, but really anyone with symptom aggravation or symptom sensitivity in relation to physical activity really would probably benefit from some sort of physical therapy involvement uh, to identify that and tease that out a little bit and then make a plan in terms of some sort of progressive kind of return to that activity. Um, individuals with balance impairments, again, individuals with visual and vestibular sensitivities, and we're going to try to touch on this a little bit more today. Um, individuals with exercise or exertion intolerance uh, or difficulty with exercise, basically or higher intensities of exercise with symptom provocation there. Neck related injury or things like whiplash following a trauma of sorts uh, with a concussion injury. Uh, and then also in return to sport considerations. And I think there's a couple things that physical therapists can, can contribute a value in, the, in this decision-making process and really tease out whether or not this, these individuals or young athletes are really ready and clear for, for returning to, to a high-risk sport or a contact sport. So just the broad categories of physical therapy assessments I'm going to touch on briefly, and then we're going to kind of dig into each, each one of them. Um, we try to use some patient reported outcome measures. Uh, we're definitely going to be looking at cervical, cervical related issues uh, in relation to some of those neck related injuries or whiplash considerations, um, visual and vestibular things, uh, balance testing uh, or, or balance assessments, uh, exertion testing. And then we're trying to look kind of functionally as well too for them, functional movements, task specific things or sport specific kind of tasks that those individuals are going to have to do uh, when they make a return to sport or when they make some sort of return to activity, whatever it is that, that is meaningful to them, um, we're going to try to make sure that we, we take a look at that and make sure that they're not having symptom provocation or aggravation with those things. So from a patient reported outcome measure standpoint, we like to use the PCSS. I think Dr. Gray probably mentioned this already. Um, we like to use this fairly regularly on eval and then on, on several follow-ups to kind of track somewhat objectively uh, where the individuals feel like they are uh, in terms of these symptom scales. Now, granted, this is a subjective scale. Um, it is definitely up to the athlete or the individual to kind of grade on their own. And so it is subject to underreporting at times. Uh, and so we try to kind of keep that in mind as, as this is one piece of this um, entire battery of tests or assessments that we can kind of administer and use to make uh, decisions based off of. Um, in our population too, though, we're working a lot with parents of these individuals. And so a lot of times uh, I'll ask or kind of dig into that with parents and, and try to get their perspective um, as a third party viewer kind of to these individuals and seeing and witnessing how they're doing with uh, with different physical activities or with schoolwork or other social stressors and things like that. Um, we'll also occasionally use the river mead uh, and then also the dizziness handicap in inventory is another uh, subjective assessment or, or patient reported outcome measure that we can use that's a little more dizziness focused if we need to. From a cervical standpoint, um, this was a, a little statistic I pulled from a paper from Carmichael in 2019. It was looking at youth uh, concussions uh, and neck injury in relation to. Uh, and so in sport-related concussions, they found about 7.2% and in non-sport-related concussions, about 
0.1%. So somewhere in this one, you know, 10 percent ish range. So one in 10 are probably going to have some sort of neck related injury. Uh, and if we're talking about sprain strains in the neck uh, and C-spine, uh, that's definitely something that, that can come into play with physical therapy and physical therapists are well equipped to deal with some of those uh, musculoskeletal injuries in the neck and the shoulders or, or upper back if need be. Um, but we'll do some special tests to clear out if there are concerns for potential upper cervical instability uh, or other things that might be concerning given the trauma or the nature of the injury. Um, We'll want to look at range of motion and this definitely comes into play uh, in, in considering what symptoms are being provoked by what uh, and later on we're going to go over the VOMS test uh, I would imagine some of you have heard about that for visual and vestibular assessments um, but looking at range of motion in the neck and really kind of trying to tease out or identify if uh, if ranges or limitations are contributing to symptom provocation that may be an indicator uh, that we might need to address some of those first before we can get an accurate assessment of some things like a, a vestibular ocular reflex that requires some head motion during that test. Um, and then we can also look at strength testing of a various shoulder or scapular musculature uh, or deep neck flexor or a cervical extensor kind of type things if we need to as well. From a vestibular component, this is where we were just talking about the VOMS test. The basic test that we use is the VOMS, the vestibular ocular motor screen. Uh, it was developed at a UPMC uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, and Ann Muka has done a lot of work uh, with this test and research on this test. Um, but it's a nice, uh, succinct clinical test that only takes a few minutes to really administer uh, and is really easy to get done and, and good and helpful for us in terms of determining what kind of categories or, or what subsets on this on this screen individuals might be a little bit more sensitive to uh, and what kind of symptoms are provoking with it. So I'm just gonna walk through it briefly. Um, basically, uh, you have an individual at rest at baseline. Uh, you're gonna take baseline measurements of, of four different symptom categories of headaches, dizziness, nausea, and, and fogginess on a zero to 10 scale. And then we're gonna administer the test following and then basically ask uh, symptom change uh, after each of those tests to try to tease out or identify which of these uh, of these um, of these tests kind of elicit more symptom aggravation or which maybe don't. Um, so smooth pursuits, uh, saccades in both the horizontal and the vertical direction, convergence, uh, and then vestibular ocular reflex in the horizontal and vertical directions, and then a visual motion sensitivity test. And so this is, a, again, this is a really easy test that we can administer in clinic, fairly straightforward, uh, and that we can glean a fair amount of information from. Um, really, uh, uh, there's been some research looking at baseline uh, norms for some of these. And so there is some uh, level of normalcy to have some symptom provocation in the zero to two kind of range. So the cutoff that's been established uh, for young athletes, and I think for adult individuals as well, is really anything that's over two is kind of indicating that this might be beyond just a normal baseline. Uh, uh, symptom provocation with any of these tests. So that's really what we're looking for to see if, if we're getting more than two out of that 10 score uh, on some of these categories, then we might want to kind of identify, uh, identify that and then work on that in our intervention area. So the pictures along the bottom and the right side of the slide uh, are showing some of these uh, just in what they would look like in clinic, um, but it's a very easily accessible test uh, and that paper that Anne had published in 2014, I believe is open access. So uh, it's listed in my references if you're looking for it as well. Uh, and then in terms of motor control or balance tests, um, we'll try to integrate some, again, easy to do kind of in-clinic type tests. The best test is a really easy one. Uh, it's the, the three different tasks, basically feet together, a single foot, and then a tandem stance, all are with eyes closed and hands on hips uh, on a stable surface and then on an unstable surface. Um, this is a, a fairly decent and easy to administer test. It, it's good at picking up really big balance impairments, I will say that, um, but it's pretty easy to kind of cap out on and so, so it does have a bit of a low ceiling effect. Uh, the functional gait assessment is another one that we can kind of use a little bit that, that's a little more dynamic, that requires some walking with some head turns or obstacle navigation, uh, things like that, that might be uh, eliciting a little bit more challenge on individuals that we can use to kind of tease out symptom provocation there. And then uh, fortunately for us in Sunnyvale, in our clinic in Sunnyvale, we have a Burtech balance system. Uh, it basically, it's a computerized dynamic posturography tool. Um, we don't use it uh, all the time for each individual, but if we are concerned for balance uh, issues more particularly, and we want to kind of dig down that a little bit, uh, it does um, allow us to do that a little bit more objectively some, with some sensory organization testing. Uh, it's just a little bit more time involved in consuming, but you can use it as a training tool. And so we have that accessible to us as well. 
Uh, from an exertion training standpoint, um, really the two big ones and the one that we use a lot of is the treadmill one. These are these are uh, tests that were developed at the University of Buffalo with Dr. Letty and Dr. Hader. Um, the Buffalo concussion treadmill test and the Buffalo concussion bike test. Um, basically, they're looking at ways that we can slowly, uh, progressively challenge the exertion of an individual on a very objective kind of measure uh, and monitor to see uh, when symptoms are provoked or if they are at all. Um, so the, the basic protocol for the test is that you have an individual on a treadmill and you take baseline symptom scores for headache and dizziness uh, or others that are relevant potentially. Uh, and then you're going to start that individual at a starting speed, usually 3 to 3.6 or 3.3 to 3.6 miles per hour at a 0% incline. And then after minute two, you're going to increase the incline of the treadmill 1% every minute. Uh, Along that time, you're going to monitor a rate of perceived exertion via the Borg scale, which is that 6 to 20 scale, uh, and then also heart rate at the same time. And what we're really looking for to see is at what heart rate point or at what exertion point uh, do these individuals start to, uh, to demonstrate symptom elevation or symptom provocation. Um, and test for calls for termination, basically, uh, if individuals get above uh, two or basically three or greater on symptom provocation or, or uh, aggravation of their baseline, um, or if they hit an exhaustion point and don't have any symptom provocation. So uh, it's a nice way to capture at what point are we starting to get more than just a little bit of symptoms uh, from a heart rate standpoint and from a perceived exertion standpoint, because uh, that can help us gauge in terms of some creating some sort of sub-symptom threshold kind of training zone for these individuals to do some aerobic exercise without eliciting some of these symptoms uh, greater than, uh, than that three-ish level out of the zero to 10. Uh, and then as PTs, we're really gonna look at functional testing too. We don't have anything standardized or really, uh, I would say hardcore objective in these realms, um, but we wanna look at running, jumping, change of direction, uh, rotation kind of type tasks. Again, sport specific things that are relevant to the tasks that these individuals are gonna need. Uh, so if they're a volleyball player or, or a basketball player and they're doing more jumping kind of type motions, then we're probably gonna have them do some of those and see how, the, how they feel with some of that. Or if they're soccer and doing a little more sprints or prolongs, prolonged uh, running or change of direction, kind of cutting cutting type tasks. We want to see um, how they respond, if they're able to tolerate that at the assessment, but at least at some point along our time working with them. So that was basically, uh, I would say, a broad kind of overview of the assessments. What I want to do is, is go over kind of, a, again, a broad idea of the interventions, but a lot of it really depends on what we're identifying during some of those assessments. So um, big picture wise, obviously, again, like we had talked about, if cervical range of motion is a big issue, then we're going to try to do some things to address that, whether it's some stretches or exercises that are targeting end range of motion in some of those, uh, some of those positions, um, strengthening exercises for the neck, stabilizers or scapular stabilizers or trunk extensors in general uh, can be really beneficial and helpful. The vestibular rehab therapy um, really stems off of this concept of basically like desensitization, habituation, and kind of adaptation exercises. So what we want to do is use things like the VOMs or other tasks that are going to provoke symptoms potentially of this headache and dizziness and try to identify these uh, lower intensities where individuals could get that done and then slowly and progressively challenge them to higher, uh, higher and more challenging and, uh, stimuli in those realms um, and, and hopefully get them to a point where they're not having symptoms during day-to-day -day activity or with return to sport kind of type activity. So we use various gaze stabilization tasks, saccades, smooth pursuit tasks in a variety of contexts uh, and we're going to kind of go over that a little bit more. Uh, and then we'll do various balance training or motor control tasks, uh, coordination things where we're doing dual tasking, individuals doing you know a couple different things at once, like a balance task and like a cognitive task, like a, a number counting task in odd numbers or um, you know various uh, different things that's gonna challenge them from, from multiple systems at a time. And then the exertion training is a big one also that we try to really address kind of, again, basing off of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test and trying to identify these sub-symptom threshold zones where individuals can train uh, without eliciting too many symptoms, um, but where they're getting some benefit from having some cardiovascular exercise and aerobic exercise. And then again, the functional and sport specific kind of type uh, activities, things that are relevant to these individuals and what they'll be doing on the field or on the court or in day-to-day -day activity. So over the next couple of slides, what I wanted to do is kind of go over uh, like three different kind of sample categories. Uh, one sample basically for individuals who are a little bit more sensitive and early, potentially early acute, 
uh, one for individuals that are a little bit more in the mild, moderate kind of zone, and then one for individuals who are doing really well, but maybe just having some symptoms with higher level tasks and what our interventions might look like in those kind of cases or those categories. Um, so the first one we're going to go over is in an early acute or high symptom sensitivity kind of state. And so these might be these individuals who are testing a little bit higher on some of the bombs tasks um, where they're getting symptoms up maybe in the five to seven, eight range. Uh, and their PCSS scores are probably a little bit higher. They might be reporting issues with day-to-day -day activities, simply like walking or going up and down stairs or visual perturbations like that. Um, and they're not able to tolerate very much. This is very common for some of our, our cases really early on uh, where they're just still really, uh, really irritated from the trauma and the concussion and, and not able to do a lot, but we still wanna try to figure out some things that they can do and tolerate uh, to kind of start this rehabilitative process. So. Uh, in the realm of vestibular rehab training, uh, with the VOR training, which is that vestibular ocular reflex training, uh, we're going to do some uh, potentially drills like that that are very simple and in sitting positions where they're a little bit more supported or with a back up against a chair or a wall. Um, similarly, with the saccades or smooth pursuits, um, we might be just doing lower rep counts or, or shorter durations and little bits that they can handle without more than, again, kind of more than that three out of 10 increase from our baseline symptom level. We'll do different balance activities, but this may be more with eyes open kind of type positions on firm surfaces. Uh, and then from an exertion standpoint, the one that we really like to do early on with individuals is stationary bike. And there's a lot of benefit from the stationary bike in that um, if individuals are sensitive to kind of vertical perturbation a little bit more, they're, they're sitting in a static position where their visual uh, point is focused and stable and they're not moving up and down, but they are able to use their legs uh, on the bike, obviously in a way that we can get an elevation in heart rate potentially and, and glean some of the benefit from these cardiovascular, cardiovascular activities uh, in these early stages without irritating them from a visual standpoint. Uh, and then physical activity, other things that we can kind of get in are more static kind of type things like wall sits, planks, where they're not moving a lot or not rotating or not standing and sitting up and down. Stationary things where they're sitting uh, and doing some light arm exercises uh, or different leg exercises and sitting. So things like that that aren't going to provoke a lot of symptoms with a lot of movement if individuals are really sensitive to some of these up and down or side to side motions uh, as many times, uh, many often are in this early stage. As we go more into kind of a, a mid stage with uh, moderate symptom sensitivities, um, VOR training or saccades or these smooth pursuits of vestibular rehab therapy, we might do more dynamic things like walking and doing a VOR task where they're doing the head turns while walking uh, or they're doing uh, different gaze stabilization tasks during other motions like squats or lunges or uh, sidestepping or, or rotating kind of type things. They might do smooth pursuits where they're, they're following a tennis ball from a hand to hand in, in place or they're walking and doing that or walking backwards and doing that. There are various ways that we can kind of intensify and challenge these individuals in these tasks and still work on visual things with a more dynamic uh, and, and moving environment. Um, and then we can also incorporate things like, uh, like dual tasking, like we had talked about before, uh, where they may be doing a psychotic drill, but then I'm also having them count in multiples of three or, or call out responses uh, on like a letter Q. If I call the letter B, I'm going to have them call the letter before that and say A. So different prompts that's going to make them to challenge a little bit from a cognitive standpoint uh, while they're doing these other tasks, um, just to challenge their system a little bit more. And then from an exertion training standpoint, we might be able to enter into some things where there may be a little bit more up and down motion, like an elliptical walking is usually fine, but if we're going to go a little faster, an elliptical is a nice, easy, uh, non jarring kind of type motion. Uh, but if they can start jogging, then we start to encourage jogging or, or other things at moderate heart rate levels that, that, um, that will kind of promote more and more of this. Uh, cardiovascular activity at again at sub symptom threshold zones that, are, that is hopefully progressing as we go on with time. And then for late stage individuals, this is where we want to really kind of challenge these, these athletes to, to things that they're going to be doing potentially again on field or on court. So these individuals might present basically fine at base level or at day to day uh, activities. They don't have much symptoms, but the second they start to get on a court or or they're doing some of these non-contact practice type things and they're starting to have symptoms at higher exertion levels, then we can kind of tease out a little bit what might be still lingering effects might, might need to be addressed still. Um, so if it's more complex VOR training, again, psychotic training or smooth pursuits trainings, we might add more complex backgrounds like dynamic backgrounds. There's a variety of YouTube videos that allow you to do different smooth pursuit tasks on a video 
um, with a moving background, like a basketball kind of scene behind it or a soccer ball scene kind of behind it. And you're having to track a ball while there's other stuff moving in the periphery. Um, we'll do more jumping or, or ladder or agility drills, cone drills, um, box jumping kind of type things, anything that's going to challenge them a little bit more. And then we can kind of tack on different, again, like dual task things like uh, having an individual look up at, at, at you as a therapist, uh, uh, putting out numbers for them to call out while they're doing a ladder drill. So they're having to visually be focused on one place while they're doing this task with their feet and their body, and then cognitively being able to identify and then call out these numbers uh, or whatever the cue might be. Um, again, exertion, this might be where we do get a little more objective, specifically in terms of our, our duration or heart rate zones that we're really trying to push these individuals to train in. Um, but again, higher heart rate levels, probably more running or more uh, sports specific kind of type drills. Um, <clears throat> and then agility and change of direction type things, predictive versus reactive kind of type tasks. Uh, and again, potentially some higher intensity resistance training. Um, in terms of PT considerations for return to sport, we don't have a gold standard for this. It's, we try to just piece together as much as we can. Um, we try to follow the general guideline with the Berlin consensus with following these return to sport kind of considerations, uh, exertion testing, or again, you're going to try to do the Buffalo concussion treadmill test or the bike test to kind of clear that. VOMS testing, we'd like to see in a minimal, probably less than that too. The PCSS, relatively low scores. Uh, and then some of the balance testing if we need to. Um, and again, it's a lot of pieces of a puzzle that we try to put together to try to make as best a, an educated kind of recommendation that we can with this. Uh, and if my, my last picture is if you take away anything else from this talk, it's that exercise is really medicine for concussion. Dr. Letty, this is a paper that he published, actually a commentary kind of on this, looking at some of the literature behind some of the cardiovascular and early exercise. Uh, and there's just found to be a lot of benefit um, from a blood perfusion standpoint. Uh, and I think it, from uh, the safety standpoint of integrating it really early on. And so we really need to challenge uh, to keep these individuals active uh, in again, that kind of a sub-symptom threshold level uh, early on uh, and really promote uh, some active rehab in this realm. Thank you for taking the time and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Okay. so. There are uh, a few questions in the Q&A section, and we'll go through these. Uh, Tim and I will answer these questions. Um, so the first question that came up is um, providing recommendations on how to progress cognitive and physical activity when a per person is utilizing uh, NSAIDs for pain management, and would this mask the underlying symptoms and cause concern for setbacks? So I actually tell athletes before we um, begin our uh, return to play protocol that they need to be off medications and they need to be back at school full time. So um, it's, you know, oftentimes athletes, they want to get back to their sport and they don't really care about being in school. And so I want to make sure that we're getting them back to school and they're off all medications before progressing them. Um, the next question, um, if we're looking at uh, symptom scores, is there a risk for prolonged symptoms? So I will say um, anecdotally, uh, the patients I see in clinic who have very high symptom scores, um, I find that uh, their recovery is actually, it tends to be longer. So if someone comes in initially with a symptom score of five or six, um, I tend to be a little less concerned in terms of prolonged symptoms uh, for them compared to someone who comes in with a score in the 50s or 60s. Um, and then for those patients who have really high scores, I'm already starting to think about, okay, what other services will they need? What other types of therapy could they potentially benefit from? And then working with Tim or another physical therapist to kind of think about, okay, would they benefit from getting in quite early um, for that uh, vestibular ocular uh, physical therapy? Um, okay, updates on changes in sports over the years in reducing concussion. And so there are a couple in, so in the US, I know some of our participants are um, from other countries. Um, in the US, there have been um, some sports that have had some big changes. So in 2016, um, rules were made uh, in soccer. And so heading was not allowed in uh, athletes less than 10 years of age. And then there are additional rules. Um, 
if head if headers are being performed, there couldn't be more than 15 to 20 per week. And so the idea is that we're trying to protect individuals from head injury. And so really eliminating that um, as a possibility of cause of head injury. About two years ago, there were some changes made in uh, the sport of football, American football. Um, no helmet to helmet uh, hits were allowed. And then you're also not allowed to do any blindside blocks. So if a player can't see you, you can't come and tackle them. And so those changes were also made. Um, there's other sports that have changes, but those are sort of the, the kind of big ones that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, okay, impact testing. So I actually don't use impact testing in my clinic. Um, we do have um, a couple clinics in our group who do impact testing. And part of the reason why I don't use it is, um, so impact testing for those who aren't aware. So it's essentially an online computer test and you're testing different aspects of brain function. Um, the way some clubs and teams administer impact testing, they'll get a large gym or a large room and have all of their athletes, you know, 50 athletes at a time come in and do the impact testing. There's actually been studies that show that that's not beneficial. Um, there's, uh, it's not a great way to test individuals. If you're going to test them, it, it needs to be, it should be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they're just doing their tests by themselves. The idea is that you're recording a baseline level and then you're actually, um, you're using it as a tool in the return to play process. So it's not used to diagnose a concussion, but it's actually helping you see, okay, what, how do they compare to before their head injury? So what some athletes have started to do is they'll actually, you know, what, sandbag their initial test so that their score is lower at, for their baseline. So if you if you look at the literature um, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, it's typically around um, in the 80s, but there's a lot of um, variability in that. There's been some research looking at um, language barriers in terms of the testing and age appropriate age appropriateness. Um, so I find that most people do not have a baseline test. And so I just choose uh, not to use that one particular test in the um, in, in my management of concussion patients. Um, okay, Tim, do you wanna take over some questions? It looks like- uh, This questions next on. one is, um, is VOMS available for general use and does it require pre and post concussion testing? It is available for general use. Um, and, you know, in terms of pre and post, it always just depends on if you have access to the athlete prior to an injury. A lot of times on our end, at least as therapists, we're not getting them until after they've been seen by a primary care or sports medicine physician after they've been diagnosed with a concussion. So we do recognize that, that it's hard to kind of infer a lot uh, if they don't have a baseline score of some sort, because there is some variability. And again, the test has some built-in cutoffs that accounts for some uh, some symptom provocation for normal the normal population, and that's about that two out of ten level on the headache, dizziness, um, nausea, and the fogginess scales. Um, but this is definitely something that we consider, uh, especially as individuals get later on and potentially, you know, uh, they're not presenting with any other big red flags or concerns, um, but maybe they're in the three or four range. Uh, if they had a history of motion sickness or or motion sensitivity, a lot of times that can play into just general baseline sensitivity to some of these VOR tasks or or the visual motion sensitivity testing. So um, uh, it's, it's more ideal if we have a pre, but it's not required and definitely not all the time. Um, I think this feeds into the next question with the vestibular ocular dysfunction compared to pre-injury baseline. Uh, um, it is if we have it. Uh, and then again, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think some research looking at convergence insufficiency and the prevalence of that. Uh, and so that as a component of the VOMS, again, is not a standalone in terms of a diagnosis classification or, or an ability for us to diagnose a concussion. But again, we recognize that it's there, that, that there could have been elements of it there beforehand. Uh, and so again, this is um, all taken with a grain of salt when we're making decisions with these athletes. Uh, can we get a copy of the PCSS? I think uh, we'll have to see if Courtney, if we can include maybe like a hard copy of the one, Aaron, if we have that. But PCSS is pretty generally available online too. You can you can get a hold of it. Um, I, I think just in a Google search, there's PDFs everywhere. Uh, a lot of people use it. It's probably one of the more commonly used uh, patient report of outcome measures for research purposes. Uh, 
is there a role for a, P, a primary care administration of uh, PCSS and using a cutoff? I don't know that there's any established cutoff. Dr. Creep, any, I, no? I don't think so. I think the, the patients who I see in clinic, sometimes I'll see um, patients who are coming in right after their head injury. And then I also see patients where um, their pediatrician or family medicine physician it, it maybe the symptoms are have been prolonged. We've gotten to the four week range, and they're they're not sure what they should do at that point. So they'll refer them to me. So um, there's really no cutoff. I mean, I'm happy to see people, um, you know, with any type of symptom score, and I'm happy to help out any primary care physician in the management of their concussion patients. Um, I think it's I think it's good if you're seeing concussion patients. You want to have. Um, some type of uh, some type of symptom score list that you're following and you're monitoring. Um, the other question I often ask patients is, which I, I think is good to ask patients and actually the parent who's there, is what percentage do you think you're back to your baseline? And you'll you'll you know oftentimes athletes will be they'll be honest with where they're at. They'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm maybe 80%. And it, it's really good for me and for the parents because the parents will say, oh, I thought they were at, you know, 99%. And so it's a good tool to use. So I, I like to include that question too. But I think if you're seeing concussion patients, I think it's important to have some type of symptom checklist, um, but there's not a hard cutoff um, that would indicate a referral. Yeah. And it's, I would say it's definitely helpful for us too. If, if we get a referral from primary care to have some background information on where they started with their PCSS scales. And again, that's an easy one to administer and pretty standard across providers. So um, I, I would highly recommend utilizing it. Next question, Tim, how often yeah. does a patient do the exercises recommended by physical mm -hmm. therapy? Well, <laughs> Which a is a great question in general for any <laughs> physical therapy this for anything. This is true, this is true. No, I would say in the realm of the vestibular rehab stuff, uh, we're going for like adaptation changes or habituation things. So a little higher in the volume and repetition kind of scale uh, is what we're looking for. So I try to encourage patients to do it daily, if not maybe a couple times a day for a couple simple things like a saccade task or a VOR task uh, or some of these balance tasks. They're going to be, uh, I would say, fatiguing probably more so from uh, a little bit of the cognitive kind of component, but not physically challenging. So not like what we would think about with like a resistance training exercise where you might want that day off between. So these ones we can kind of push a little bit more on the, on the regular, on the daily kind of or multiple times in a day. Um, but again, it depends on each individual and where they're starting from and where their symptom burden kind of is uh, and, and how sensitive they are to some of these uh, irritations. So it, it just it kind of depends, but we try to do it more often. Uh, referral process for your clinic. Um, again, I think Dr. Green mentioned there's a referral. You can refer to our sports medicine clinic, uh, and then they could kind of refer to physical therapy via that way. Um, for physical therapy, you could also just refer directly to the Stanford Children's Physical Therapy Services or Rehab Services um, if you're in the local area. Um, we can, I think we can probably provide that. All that information is on our website as well. And then is there an adult clinic? Yes, there, there is an adult, and at least from physical therapy, there's a balance uh, and busyness kind of clinic up there that does handle some of the adult-related concussion stuff. Um, they're a separate group from us, um, but there is an adult sign. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a, a question actually I'm gonna pull from the chat um, about the Epoly maneuver from Dr. Guzman, I think. Uh, is there benefit for using the epoly maneuver for vestibular systems? Yes, absolutely. If uh, BPVV is a concern and you've done like a Dix Hall pike to diagnose it, absolutely. There's a there's a, a role for an epoly maneuver to be used. It's not a, I would say just included if they're having dizziness symptoms or VR. Not all concussion cases are going to present with concurrent BPVV, but if you identify it, definitely it's indicated. Um, there's a question about, as a pediatrician, what screening do I need in my office prior to referring to ortho and PT? So I would say, um, you know, as Tim mentioned, it's important for us to have some uh, baseline information in terms of the initial visit. So I think if you're doing some type of symptom screening and have a score for that, that would be great. It's, it's nice to know if a patient coming in had an initial score of 
five versus 50 when I'm seeing them and now their score is, you know, 80 or whatever the case may be. So I think just having a general symptom score is really good um, when you're referring patients over. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I think just having some just some baseline information in terms of that. I don't think anything else uh, more in depth needs to be done. If you've done some of the testing that we've talked about, that's great. If you don't feel comfortable doing that type of testing, then I would um, send them over sooner rather than later. Um, I generally follow up with my concussion patients uh, every two weeks. Um, you know, if they have really prolonged symptoms, we'll kind of stretch it out a little bit, uh, maybe three weeks. Um, but in the beginning, I want patients, if, they're, if their symptoms aren't improved and they're not ready for clearance in two weeks, I definitely want them coming back in mm -hmm. and seeing me for their symptoms. Um, let's see. A question about gymnasts and VOR training for twisties or loss of awareness. Great question recent context of the Olympics stuff. Uh, you know, it, it really depends on probably what's driving some of these quote unquote twisties or loss of air awareness. Um, if they're having VR sensitivity for, for other reasons unrelated to con concussion and VOR is eliciting some symptoms of some sort, sure, you could make the argument that you could probably habituate to those tasks a little bit more and train some of that. I don't know that in the case that you're probably, we're probably thinking of um, with Simone Biles, uh, I don't know that that was driven by some of the VR, like lack of sort of uh, sensitivity there. I think there were some other things from a psychological probably standpoint going on. So other contributors, again, it just really depends on what's driving driving this complaint or loss of function or, or ability. There's a question about mig relief that I mentioned. So mig relief is a combination of magnesium and riboflavin or B2. Um, which is, if you recall, it's some of the some of the research that um, is currently it's currently being done in this area. Those are some of the the magnesium and riboflavin are two of the things I mentioned um, for the headache relief. I usually recommend this as an option if patients are having prolonged headaches and they don't want to do something like a triptan or an abortive medication. I think it's a good um, it's a good option for them. Um, the other one that I'll um, sometimes recommend is high dose um, omega-3s, which there's been some studies in rat models. And so I'll tell people, you know, if, if, if you want something else to try, then let's try that. I, I don't have them do all these, I don't have them start all these uh, different things concurrently, but if um, they're having prolonged uh, headaches and they want something else to try, because they don't want to kind of bump up to that next level of medication. Um, the high dose omega-3s is something I also recommend. Um, concussion patients are agitated. How are we supposed to handle that in terms of exercise prescription? Um, so in terms of agitation, um, so I would, so if someone came in and was super agitated, that's something that I might um, explore a little bit further. I think in terms of the emotional symptoms and the sadness and all of that, I think it's possible that they're um, upset, but I would be curious if there was something else going on, if they were um, very agitated when they were seeing me in clinic. And um, so that I might start think thinking about, you know, is this someone that we're gonna have to do more neuropsychological evaluation? And is there something more going on? And looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, which is um, something that's also been shown to help with concussion patients. So um, for that patient, I, I, you know, again, I, even if people are having low level symptoms, I, or any symptoms in general, I'll tell them to start off with some basic, just walking, walking around the block. So I would start off really easy with that patient and not progress um, too quickly in terms of an exercise prescription. Not to interrupt, let's do maybe one or two more questions. We're kind of at the end of our time here and then we'll wrap up. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, okay. Um, so the best sideline assessment for concussion after a head impact. So you, the tests that we use on the sideline um, are the SCAT tests. So you go through, uh, you can also find this online um, if you look for, if you search for SCAT and concussion. 
And so that has a whole, it's a, a few pages that you can go through and get, um, and it's great because then you have a baseline score if you're sending them to ortho or um, you're gonna follow them in clinic. Um, so that's that's typically the sideline assessment that we're, that we're doing. Um, and it, 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 so in terms of the brief cognitive screen, so there's a whole um, mini mental status exam and there's memory tests. And so that's a great place to, to start in terms of a sideline assessment. Um, okay, um, so the California stepwise laws for return to play um, for players wanting to progress um, okay, so for California, if you go to the CIF website, um, they that's a great website and they have information on return to play. So what it is, it's, it's a so just briefly, it's a it's a gradual it's a gradual progressive return to physical activity. And what you're doing is you're trying to stress the body to see if you're if you're taking oxygen and blood away from your brain, is that producing symptoms? So the idea is that every 24 hours, you're bumping up uh, in terms of intensity and duration to see if it causes symptoms. If you do, then if so, if the athlete has symptoms, then you need to drop back down the next day and, and continue that process. The CIF one, you can see, it's broken down a little bit further. Each step is actually, a couple of them are broken into A and B. Um, so there's a slower progressive return on that one, but that's a great website. And I, I tell athletes, um, you have to, so in terms of the question also includes recommendation to return to exercise. So athletes cannot do any type of contact activity until they've been cleared by a physician. So as they're going through the return to play protocol, um, they're increasing their physical exertion, but at no point should they be doing anything where they can have contact activity or have another head injury. And the reason for that is you wanna, you wanna prevent second impact syndrome. And that's really important. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, you, it's something that we have to follow and athletes uh, need to be cleared before they return to any contact activity. So I would recommend that website, it's great. Um, okay, Courtney, are we out of time here? Um, unless there's another question that you guys see that's pertinent to finish with. Uh, there's one about vestibular ocular therapy standard and PT services. Uh, at this point in, in my understanding, I feel like where PT is from, a, practice standard and not necessarily. So I would really look for clinics that uh, that are, I would say, a little bit more trained or experienced in concussion. Even within our clinic, we, we have a few PTs, but not every PT is, is trained to kind of work with concussion cases. So um, I wouldn't just assume, uh, I'd kind of make sure if you're going to send somebody somewhere that, that they have that. Um, thank you to Dr. Grieve and Tim for this excellent lecture this morning.